all of these commercial properties are that are in so much trouble, the retail, the office space, those are backed by mortgage-backed securities right. that finance those deals. And those are going to default. Those bonds are going to default. The securities are going to default. And that's a domino. The residential market, I don't think, has that problem to any great degree. Now, whatsoever. they corrected a lot. They, they put a lot of risk controls in after the sub, subprime debacle. There was a lot more risk controls that were there. Um, or the and, residential side. On the residential side. It's my pleasure to welcome Ari Rastigar. He's the founder of Rastigar Property Company, and uh, they do a lot of stuff, a lot of different investing uh, in a lot of different sectors, but uh, focus a lot on multifamily investing. So we'll talk about that today. Ari, welcome from, uh, welcome. I know you're coming from Austin, so welcome. How are you? Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, good to have you. So uh, what is going on with, you know, we've heard a lot about rent collection issues and eviction moratoriums. And, you know, we have had a lot of people concerned about that. But since we play mostly in the single family home space, Uh it's like a non-issue. But I know it's more of an issue in the apartment space. Definitely was just reading an article this morning in Globe Street about that and how, you know, collections were declining. Um, One of the things that I I don't think a lot of people realize, though, Ari, is that, um, you know, collections are always an issue. That's just a normal course of business, right? So you never have 100% collections. Nobody has that. Uh, Well, you call it, yeah, you have a vacancy rate. You factor in your underwriting always. Yeah. So, So what is it looking like now? And, you know, what are you guys doing? Are you working out deals with your tenants and so forth? Promise to pay deals, et cetera. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, I, I think there's, there. you know, you, you kind of got to bifurcate that conversation a little bit, as you said. So if you look at it in a macro level, the United States, at the height of COVID, you know, still about 90% of rents were being collected in multifamily across the entire United States. 90% is a huge number when you're talking about a pandemic. In Austin, for us in particular, we collected 99% of our rents. In fact, we collected more of our rents at the same time during COVID than we did the previous year. And that had a lot to do with you know, people were staying home and they didn't know they had their jobs and they wanted to make sure they have a roof over their head. And we collected that data through a series of surveys, talking to them. But Austin's a unicorn, right? So Austin is not, you know, indicative of the rest of the United States or some other types of cities. And once you start digging into class A versus vintage, and it it starts to get a little bit, little bit more difficult. Um, But in Texas as a whole, rents were collected in the mid nineties. And as you mentioned, you know, most months you may be in the mid 90% in the mid 90% of collections are are being paying are paying. Absolutely. So when you start to see those numbers come down on an average basis, you're watching on the East coast, the West coast, New York city is an example. This time last year had 5,600 vacant apartments right now they have 25,000 vacant apartments. So that number that's being pulled down is really in these larger primary markets, like your San Francisco's, your Los Angeles's, um, and the New York's, but overall, multifamily, certainly in the class B, class C space and the value add space that we play in mostly, collections have been really strong, you know, and so compared to retail or some of these other ad- or hospitality that have dropped completely off a cliff, um, you know, they really have seen multifamily be a flight to security. And it's why you haven't seen cap rates comp- um, expand as much as people thought they were going to or see these, you know, blood in the street type deals in markets, certainly in the Sun Belt, like in the Nashville's, the Texas, the Florida, the Phoenix, um, it's fared really, really well. And, um, yeah, you know, know. And, that's- yeah. and this, this is the problem, you know, I'm battling this all the time. Like every time I, I post a video or do an interview on someone else's YouTube channel, you get these comments from these people that just know, they just don't know what they're talking that's about. That's just not, so these are, this is the data. The data is that overall 90% of the collections in the entire United States were multifamily. That's an extraordinary right. number. Yeah. Right. So, so everybody says though, you know, well, not everybody, but you know, these uninformed people are just talking about like how they're going to pick up deals at 50% of the price they're at today. Next I'm not year. seeing them. I mean, they're, they're out of their mind. They're just out of their By mind. By the way, how funny in your space, in the single family space, we're actually seeing a surging of home prices. So people I are leaving the urban core. Austin, yeah. the median housing price just broke $375,000 
And so it's certainly in markets like, like we mentioned, like the, the Nashvilles, the Raleigh, Charlotte, Florida, Phoenix, these well, growing cities. You can cities. just say the Sun Belt and the, the Northern and the, you know, the Southeast, you know. Sure. I mean, yeah. housing prices are going up and, yeah. and rents are still increasing. Cap rates, if anything, are staying stable and rents are coming down, which that by itself is a little bit of an anomaly for rates to be this low you know, we should see cap rates compress a little bit and they're staying a little bit stable. In some instances, they are compressing, um, but you have to look at things more than ever on a case-by-case basis, on a corridor-by-corridor basis, um, you know, when you, when, you do, when you do your underwriting. But I'll tell you from a financing standpoint, there has never been more accretive financing on the agency side than there is today. I mean, I just got a quote for 2.6%, 12 years with Fannie Mae with five years of IO. I mean, that's, I mean, I don't know how, like, you know, it's, you know, pretty unbelievable. Below the rate of real inflation. I mean, it's effectively free money. I mean, and it's not, it's not free. They're paying you to take it. Literally. Yeah, Yeah. I I couldn't agree with you more. So so we're seeing great opportunities, but what I've told folks, they're like, oh, so you're getting this, you know, huge discount. I'm like, no, I'm actually just buying deals from guys that I thought would never sell, you know, so this, there's a gentleman in town, you know, you know, pretty famous guys in his 70s, owed a bunch of stuff. And, you know, it was always like, oh, I'll just pass it on to my kids. And so we're paying market. But the fact that he's like, you know what? I'm tired of this. I don't know if I want to deal with this. I want to go to my house, Martha's Vineyard. Here's what it's worth, Ari. I'll sell it to you. And so the fact that you're getting it is the deal. But, you know, I'm not seeing this distress in the multifamily sector. I mean, hospitality, retail, we don't play in that space as much. And I read the news, but, you know, I'm sure there's distress there. Yeah. So there's distress in urban core markets in, you know, the sort of the former, and I think it's former trophy cities, San Francisco, LA, New York, Seattle, uh, even San Diego, I think. Chicago. Uh, you know, downtown, uh, definitely Chicago downtown, um, you know, Boston, any of any of this downtown stuff anywhere, right? You know, people don't want to be in high density. They don't want to live in a riot zone, um, you know, and it's, there's this flight to the suburbs, right? These suburban markets are, are really uh, strong. So that's interesting. Now, I want to ask you about, you know, some predictions of what you think is going to happen next year or the year after. But before we do that, Uh, Let me just show you something. I'm going to share my screen here. And I want to show you something because I think, Ari, this might represent uh, shadow demand, uh, which is is sort of an interesting concept of these sort of unseen shadow demands. Can you see this chart? I can. Okay. Wow. And this... This is shocking. And what this, if if you're only listening on audio and not seeing this on video, which, you know, it'll be on our YouTube channel too. The majority of U.S. young adults now live with their parents. This is at the highest point ever recorded. And we're going back 120 years, okay? When in the old days, you know, people did live with their parents. I mean, even in the Great Depression in the 30s, there were fewer people living at home uh, between 18 and 29 years old than there are today. That, that's absolutely amazing, right? Uh, during the Great Depression in the 30s, it was only 43%. Now it's 52%. During the Great Recession 10, 12 years ago, it was 44% is where the top number was. So, you know, eventually these kids are going to move out yes. and they're going to need a place to live. So, it, you know, this is a shadow demand for you know a lot more demand for houses and apartments right i love i love the way i love the way you explain that and this this is fantastic this is fantastic data and you know another thing to kind of dovetail into it and emphasize the point is that millennials and i i kind of joke that i'm like the i'm the oldest millennial i'm 38 years old so i'm like kind of the old and young guy both right um and millennials rent as a general rule. And it, it's not that they don't have money necessarily. It's that the cult, the core values are different, right? You, you know, you want to be out more, you, you know, you change jobs more frequently than any, you know, demographic in history. And so to further that point, you know, when this demographic goes back into the workforce, once the fear factor has come and mom says, Hey, you know what, honey, come home, you know, stay here, you know, do the college maybe virtually, or I'll oh, come to you back to your bedroom. When that goes back into the market, I think it's going to create a massive demand for 
rental more than any more than anything else, whether that's single family rental um, of, you know, a few folks living together, whether or apartments. But I think this is, um, you know, a tremendous shadow demand. I, I hadn't heard that term before, but I love it, um, you know, for um, for apartment rentals in general. Yeah, yeah. And just to give credit, this chart is based on Pew Research Center data. So uh, that that's quite, um, it's really depressing, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. what are all these kids living at home for, you know, this is just a sign of the times, you know, but it, we are where we are, right? So, so interesting. So, um, you know, what, what do you think about, uh, we talked about now, and we see uh, prices increasing, we sure. see huge shortages of housing, of all the commodities, well, maybe not all, but a lot of the core commodities to build housing and apartments, lumber, huge shortages uh, with lumber uh, causing the price of the average single family home to go up like 14 to $16,000 already just because of the lumber shortage component only. Absolutely. And I think that will settle down a little bit. It's, it's kind of bad right now. I think it'll improve a little bit, but still, I think the shortage exists for sure. Um, You know, but but what's going to happen next year? What's going to happen the year after that? You know, I think I think it's it's a great way to look at it, and I always look at things as, as you know, you want the right answer, ask the right question, right? And I think in the short term, there's a lot of uncertainty. I get it, but you know, this is not the Spanish flu. This is not you know, there's the numbers are in of what we're dealing with from a COVID standpoint, and my heart obviously goes out to you know, the people that have lost family members and the suffering that we've seen, no question. I'm very sensitive to it. We know several people that have lost their parents and, you know, but at the end of the day in Austin, Texas, Austin just became the 10th largest city in the U S and I speak from that vantage point. That's where I am. Right. Um, so it passed right. ironically. Well, you do business in many markets. We do. So, so we've, we've done business yeah. in 38 cities, 12 states, uh, seven different asset classes. You know, so we run the gamble. We own property currently in Phoenix and Dallas. Austin, you know, we're around, um, okay. you know, but the net net is on a long term basis. This is all a blip. This is a complete blip. Right. And so we already were coming out of the longest bull market in history. You're already asking for a major correction in the stock market, irrespective of COVID, irrespective of the elections. PE multiples are trading at almost, you know, you know, crisis levels, regardless of anything. And even these trends that you're looking at, this exodus that we talk about. And I was joking the other day on Yahoo Finance that, you know, California and New York are the land of the flea and Texas is the land of the free, you know, and just yeah. but but the point was that that exodus had already started. A million people left California last year, 150,000 of them came to Texas. Texas. So COVID has thrown gasoline on, on a it's lot of these trends. It's accelerating the trend that it's was It's accelerating it. It's already happening. So when you look at a chart or you're a value investor, right? You know, it's different if you're a flipper or market timer. And that's just not my business. I don't understand it. I'm not a, a trader or a, you know, or a magician, right? Like, you know, if we're buying something, we're renovating it, we're creating value, we're holding it, you know, we have organic rent growth, we, you know, we're creating value, right? Just like you are. So when you look at a five-year, a seven-year, a 10-year trend, most of these things are effectively negligible um, in the grand scheme of things. I think you're going to watch you know, you're going to watch the markets, you know, probably come down in a lot of ways. You've seen the tech sector, you know, really surge, very similar to to 1999 um, in a lot of ways. So there's asking for a correction there. It's going to pull back a little bit. The Fed came out recently and said they're going to keep rates down um, till um, till 2023. Um, But what you said earlier, I really agree with is these former trophy cities, you know, the San Francisco's, the New York, the Chicago residents are starting to think like, why am I here? Like, oh, why yes. am I in this, like, why am I, so, so I lived in Manhattan for many, many years. Our daughter was born at Lenox Hill, um, our, our oldest daughter. And um, so I have a great love for New York City and great memories of being there on Wall Street. But you're there and paying the premium. My dad called it elevation training. You're meeting the people. There's proximity. You're, the banks are there. The money, you know, You're getting all these connections. But when that ceases to exist, you have to say, do I want to pay state income taxes, federal income taxes, city income taxes, pay this much for my apartment? I mean, why am I doing that? Like when I can have Google Fiber in Austin or Kansas City, like it doesn't make sense. It's just totally overrated, you know. That and and the chart on the screen now, I hope you can see that. Just uh, looks at Manhattan apartments. Something that you mentioned earlier. Manhattan apartments see record loss in sales. Uh, quick facts uh, from the second quarter. So this is totally the most current data, right? 
um, because that it's going to keep through. dropping. I mean, this these numbers don't surprise me, but this is going to keep. I mean, these numbers. I believe that New York has seen its last day in that regard. I mean, I don't believe it'll ever go back to what it once was at its peak. I think there will certainly be corrections. I don't think it's going to be, you know, disappear and turn into zombie land by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but people, but, people but don't see the value what anymore. Gotta, Ari, what we've got to remember is when, and by the way, this chart on the screen is from CNBC and I'll, I'll just, let me just say it for the people only listening on audio. Okay. So uh, second quarter sales of Manhattan apartments down by, you ready for this, folks? 54%. That's a crazy more number, than, by the way. That's a crazy that's number. A, that's shocking. Like, that's shocking. It's not 20%. It's not, you know, 30%. It's 54%. Total sales, the lowest number on record of only 1,147 sales. Now, this is a, the biggest city in America. Okay, where you've got a population density of 27,000 people per square mile. Right. So only 1,100 deals happened, right? Um, median sales price down 18%. That's the number that is going to just dramatically compress, if you ask me. And this is just a proxy for any other city, okay? Like, it's you know, we're talking about Manhattan because it's famous. But San Francisco, you know, L.A., where I grew up, um, you know, Portland, downtown, downtown areas anywhere, Portland, Seattle, uh, downtown San Diego, all of this stuff, you know, Boston. I, I sort of wonder about Miami. I, I'm in Palm Beach, Florida. Um, and I got to think it's going to happen there definitely in the high rise world. Miami's a different rise. animal. Miami's a different it's animal. It's a little bit different, I know. I, it's I a different animal it's because different. it's it's used mostly as a currency hedge from foreign investors. So it's, yeah, you can't yeah. look at Miami as a typical right. American city. It, it's different rules. And there's, you know, yeah. it's, you know, you watch it through different cultures, different, you know, demographics have gone in there and bought it for different reasons than typical investing. Yeah. Um, and I got to believe. Well, you have that in New York too. You have a lot of Russian and Ukrainian money. You do. You do. Well, the, the old joke used to be on Wall Street. If you invest in Manhattan from overseas, you don't get fired if it doesn't work, right? Like you could kind of yeah. still like, you know, you bet on Manhattan, it's like you're not going to get fired. But if you pick like, you know, Houston and you and you were wrong, like you're for sure gone. Um, right. You know, which is, um, and, that, and that's all changing. And Florida, I'm so bullish on Florida long term in general for a lot of the same reasons as Texas. The exodus of the East Coast is going to come to Florida. The East Coast has always had a friendly relationship with Florida. We know that. But look at your Naples, your Boca, Palm Beach. I mean, Fort Myers, forget about it. I mean, these cities are exploding and for the right reason, same as Texas, because there's jobs and there's fair weather climate and there's lower cost of living, you know, and there's that actual it's like oh it's booming i'm like booming insinuates a bust this is because right. the freaking job is there this is because there's actual you know sustainable infrastructure that allows a better standard of living and i think it's important to make that dichotomy right yeah no i agree with you and you didn't mention but you you know you you were mentioning it in, in what you were saying anyway business friendly and also landlord friendly so good places to invest this chart is from uh, Miller Samuel and Douglas Elliman. I had the uh, CEO of Douglas Elliman on the show before, and uh, she was talking all about how people are fleeing New York City, and you know that's really against her own self-interest. I was pretty amazed to hear that from her. But you know, this is new leases plummet in the Big Apple. Percent of year-over-year change in New York leases for May 2020 in New York City shows you Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. Manhattan down 62%, Queens down 61%, Brooklyn down 54%. So it's absolutely shocking what's going on. Now, let's go to that uh, other topic of what's going to happen next year, the year after. I mean, look, uh, no one can deny that uh, this is certainly a very uneven situation. Some people are doing fine. Some people are really suffering. Um, you know, there, there's, I don't hear much about this, but all of these commercial properties, Ari, that are in so much trouble, the retail, the office space, those are backed by mortgage-backed securities That's right. that finance those deals. And those are going to default. Those bonds are going to default. Those securities are going to default. And that's a domino. 
the residential market, I don't think has that problem to any great degree. Now whatsoever. they corrected a lot. They, they put a lot of risk controls in after the sub, subprime debacle. There was a lot more risk controls that were there. Um, or the and, residential side. On the residential side. And, yeah, you know, because yeah. that's what pulled it down last. People like, oh, is it going to be real estate? Last time was because there wasn't risk controls in the subprime market. That was a different animal, right? Um, at the end of the day, it's a game of musical chairs. Somebody's going to have to end up kind of, you know, miss, missing a chair. And when you look at the CMBS markets, you know, they still are highly inefficient right now. And there's a lot of uncertainty. But to your point, back to the question of and, and, one and year, CMBS two years. CMBS commercial mortgage-backed securities. I just... Cr- yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the bondholder. So, and effectively, what that is for people that you know are, are listening is um, the bank goes and makes a series of loans. They'll make a thousand loans at X amount, and they pool them together in what are called tranches. And then in those tranches, rating agencies will rate certain pieces of them, and then they sell them in pieces as bonds, and they collect you know an interest rate effectively. So that's in a nutshell what a CMBS is, right? Um, so. I think retail, um, hospitality, uh, and commercial is going to suffer longer, okay? Because even with the, it's going to be when the vaccine comes, not necessarily because it's solving the problem systemically, but just psychologically, it's going to give a lot of comfort because there's a lot of mental health issues, quite frankly, of people just having fear irrespective of the data. I mean, the CDC has been pretty pretty clear that the numbers around coronavirus are similar to the flu. Is the flu safe? No, the flu is nasty. It kills people. I mean, every year people die of the flu. Um, So it's going to take time, I think, psychologically for that to happen. But I also think there's a lot of pent up demand of people need wanting to travel. People are craving human connection. You know, this thing of working from home, Jamie Dimon the other day said it very openly, productivity has plummeted from people working from home. And so I believe in the office sector in general, this whole work from home for forever thing is just completely unsustainable. Is there a certain, really? absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 yeah, no, 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 no question. And it's because as humans, we're tribal beings. Okay. We work together. We, there's a human connectivity. We have, we whiteboard, we talk, we have this thing, we go to lunch together, you know, you grab a soda, grab a beer, you know, whatever you, ex, you know, there's just something that happens, you know, it's when you're together that creates productivity. But with that said, if you're a coder for Google and you don't require, you know, if you're not on the sales side of the business, yes, could that part of the business, certain sectors begin working from home? Yes. But something that's very important to remember is the largest, uh, the largest tenant in the office business, in, in, in the office sector back in the 80s and 90s were law firms, okay? And law firms once became digitized and the reason they were the largest because they had libraries. So they took all these different floors for the books, you know, for research. But once that became digitized, there was a massive vacancy that happened. And it only took about two and a half years for those vacancies to be filled back up. So I think you're going to see innovation. You're going to watch vacant um, office buildings converted some floors into multifamily, just like we saw when Sears started to go bankrupt. Folks came in and converted that into self-storage. Like you're going to watch innovation happen, which I'm excited to see. Um, But longer term, I believe all of these sectors will be, it's like retail. They said, oh, the retail apocalypse. Well, you look at Amazon, the largest e-commerce company in the world, the largest acquisition they made of 13.2 billion was Amazon, (laughs) was a brick and mortar location, which I find to be a little bit. Whole Foods. Whole Foods. Yes, Whole Foods was their largest acquisition, which is, you know, obviously founded and headquartered here. So the retail was this overcorrection. And now you're starting to see, you know, before COVID, retail start to make a resurgence because people want an experience. They want to go out. Like my kids are still sad about Toys R Us. It wasn't that you can't buy the toy on Amazon, but we like to go to Toys R Us. Like we enjoyed walking down the aisles and having this experiential kind of thing. So we get it. And I'm going back to like what's coming, if you can. What's coming is is going to be long term. Term, this is all fine is is the short answer i don't i don't believe any of this is cataclysmic at a macro level i think rents are going to grow home prices are going to go up people are going to travel again hotels are going to start to see occupancy again restaurants are closed but then but there also was too many restaurants and i think that a lot of people a lot of people then are going to other so a lot of the restaurants here that we see in austin as an example are doing phenomenal 
because they have great food. And a lot of this is capitalism. A lot of this is survival of the fittest. So some of these businesses that weren't run as efficiently should have been closed anyway. Back to that kind of COVID accelerating something that should have happened. Um, I just want to make sure we're not mixing a business closing that should have closed 10 years ago anyway. And now they just right. got a kick in the teeth and it's gone. So you were mixing those things together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph Schumpeter's creative destruction. That's what that is. There and this go. has accelerated that. And that's ultimately a good thing. It's, it's a great thing. At the time, but it's a good thing. Overall. Great thing. Yeah. Because it makes the economy adjust faster. But it's really hard to see, Ari, how, uh, how you know, what the conversions of, say, shopping malls will be. I mean, that's not easy to turn into much of anything else. Yeah, you could take the Sears and make it an Amazon distribution center, but what do you do with the rest of them all? It, it's yeah, but hard you to also turn have to factor in popu- you know, population are growing in these areas. There's mixed use developments. There, there's, there's a lot of things that can happen. On, it depends on what year we're talking about. If you say one or two years, I agree with yeah. you. I don't know what to do with that shopping mall. Over 20 years, and you look at the population growth of the cities in the Sun Belt, there's certainly going to be use for that for some of that space you know, for, for something of some sort, maybe it's a rezoning, maybe it's, you know, housing, maybe, but, but population growing at the rate that, that it is within those cities. And if you have a city like New York of everybody leaving, you're arguably talking about, you know, 20 million people, you know, in the outer New York area leaving, that's a lot of people that need houses and places to be in cities that didn't have that type of population. So right. I believe it fills. Yeah. yeah. No, I know. It's 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 pretty amazing. Well, wrap it up for us with just anything you want to say, uh, maybe something I didn't ask you, uh, whatever's, whatever you want to tell the listeners and viewers. You no, know, I, I think... I think we're all kind of news fatigued and we're, you know, seeing all this bad news constantly of this is bad, this is bad. And I'll be honest with, for us, this has been an incredible buying opportunity. We've expanded. Um, we've grown the firm. We're buying properties. Um, things are, 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 are going great in a lot of ways, meaning that, you know, Edison would say, you know, people miss opportunity because opportunity shows up in overalls. So it's more work. You're slugging through mud, but those that are going to go put in the work right now, I assure you there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to be had in a lot of these things, but you have to be a little bit long-sighted. You have to have some vision. You have to have some resilience. And, you know, if you want to take the lazy entitled approach, pretty tough time. Um, but I've actually seen it to be a tremendous opportunity because most of the competition is asleep. Yeah, right. I agree. And they're going to miss the market. All these people saying that, you know, I'm waiting. I'm going to keep my powder dry until everything's 50% off. Folks, that's just not going to happen. That's just very unlikely. <laughs> yeah. And, if, and it, it, if it does happen, if stuff gets that cheap, it will be largely there'll be bigger problems. Well, hang on. It'll be because interest rates went way up. So, you know, people always, they're looking at the price and not the payment. People buy properties based on payments, not prices. And that's why, you know, housing is actually cheaper now than it was in 2006 on a monthly payment basis. So, yeah, you know, don't don't miss the opportunity, folks. Uh, I, I totally agree with you, Ari. Give out your website or Twitter handle or whatever you want. Oh, yeah, sure. It's uh, it's Rastigar Property. Um, it's dot uh, com or on, on Instagram. It's just at Rastigar, um, which is just R-A-S-T-E-G-A-R. Good stuff. Ari, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having Happy me. Happy investing. Thank you, brother. Mm-hmm.